Hello everybody and welcome to Berean On Demand. I hope you'll stick around for this message about divine messengers. From our green campus, here's our teaching pastor, Justin Bluer, continuing our Unseen War series. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, church family. Isn't it a beautiful snowy morning out there? Wasn't that just a delight to wake up and see that this morning? As Ron said, April snow showers bring May flowers. So don't be discouraged. Uh, welcome to our online friends and our Cincinnatus and Bainbridge campuses. They get to join us here at Green by Simulcast. So let's just welcome our other church family. We are in our third week of Unseen War Battling the Darkness. And I hope it has been helpful to make you more aware of the battle that's raging around us. Has it been helpful for anyone yet? I hope so. I pray so. I know for me, it certainly has. The last two weeks, we've learned about the unseen forces of evil. We've learned about Satan. We've learned about demons. I've got good news for you. Today, we talk about the good guys. And there are good guys. And many of us have, I don't know how to say this, but we've had maybe encounters or experiences that we think might fall under this categories of these unseen good guys. I know when I was a kid, I had this really powerful and amazing experience in a moment of danger where something or someone intervened and did something for me that protected me. And to this day, when I remember that moment and I remember the miraculous thing that happened, I get kind of shivers up my spine and... I don't really understand it. I just feel a lot of gratitude for it. And that story that I have, I don't talk much about it because not only do I not fully understand it, but I'm sure the people I would tell wouldn't understand it either. Another reason I don't talk about it is because people who tell angel stories are weird. But I think a lot of us have those stories, many of them untold, and they're things that we can't explain. There are things that happen to us that we say there, there seemed like there was someone or something there who intervened, who did something in a moment of crisis, a moment of danger, a moment of confusion, and, and I'm not sure how to chalk that up. Well, some of you are wise and you're thinking, okay, Justin, we shouldn't let experiences determine truth. Amen? We should always let truth tell us what is true or false and run experience through that grid. So how do we determine what's accurate or not when it comes to angels? Well, first let me tell you what not to do. Don't build your beliefs about angels based on Hollywood's depiction of them. Uh, many of you might remember this show. Who, who remembers this family-friendly CBS show, Touched by an Angel, Angel, many of you do, Roma Downey starred as Monica, an angel who took human form and appeared to people in their moment of crisis and assisted them. And while it was real fun, good, clean entertainment, I'm not sure it should fall in the category of bona fide angel education. How about the fairly popular Disney flicks, Angels in the Outfield, in the end zone, and in the infield. Of course, that was all accurate. <laughs> all based on true stories. Uh, while it was entertaining, I'm not sure we should be taking our angel information from Disney producers who specialize in fantasy and magic rather than truth. But we definitely have to deal with what must be accurate information this morning because... All of us love Clarence. Clarence Oddbody in Jimmy Stewart's 1946 classic, It's a Wonderful Life. And when Clarence appears in the movie, he introduces himself as AS2, which stands for Angel Second Class. Because after 200 years of angeling, what has he still not earned yet? His wings! And so Clarence is on special assignment to earn his wings by assisting George Bailey. And George Bailey has one wish. He wishes he was never been born. Clarence grants him that wish, which is kind of the plot of the movie when George realizes just how rotten the world would be without him in it and realizes how good his life really was. And the movie ends with George 
having a change of heart, going back to his family, celebrating Christmas with family and friends. And one of the ending quotes in the movie is when he's with Zuzu at the Christmas tree, and Zuzu hears what? A bell and makes this statement. Every time a bell rings, say it with me, an angel gets his wings. So we're giving away angel wings today, right? And, and I think for most of us, we're like, man, that feels good. That was a neat ending. It's one of my favorite Christmas movies. And maybe there's some slivers of truth, but there's got to be more than what we've heard or seen on the big screen. There's got to be more truth about angels that's out there. Um, humans, for some reason, have always been fascinated with this concept of angels. And, I, and I've kind of singled out Hollywood for their depictions, but we're fascinated with them. We have angels everywhere. I mean, we have them on our Christmas trees. We have them on our condolence cards. We have them on tattoos. Angels are everywhere. We're fascinated with them, and probably for pretty good reason. So today, rather than just taking what we've seen from Hollywood or taking what we've experienced, let's look at the only verified source of information about the supernatural that we have. And we're going to open up this bona fide, verified record and see what God has to say. Because here's the thing. I think God wants to give us clarity about angels. So let's see what he says. Would you turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6? This might not be where you expected to turn this morning, but bear with me as we study 2 Kings 6. Uh, page 306 in your chair Bible, and if you are using a, a phone Bible, you can tap to NLT to follow along with us, and feel free, if you'd like a Bible, take that one, uh, the one that's in your chair, take it home with you as our gift, and we put an angel in every Bible today. Uh, <laughs> maybe not, sorry about that. Second Kings chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 8, Okay. Here we go. When the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officers and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on the alert there. Now, now let me give you just a little bit of background here before we go further. Elisha is what's called a prophet. So he's a human messenger of God. He would, he would receive divine revelation. He would then give that to the people even if they didn't want to hear it. And usually, they didn't. And so prophets were kind of those truth-to-power people where they would speak the truth, and they were usually universally hated for their honesty and often killed because of it. And Elisha is such a man. So he's got this direct line with God, which allows him to kind of CIA the enemy, and so he's getting their plans as they speak their plans in secret at these officers' meetings. He somehow had direct line from God to tap into their plans to hear it and to tell his king. And, and he keeps rescuing his nation. Verse 11, the king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officers together and demanded, which of you is the traitor? Who's the Benedict Arnold? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? I mean, it's very obvious. The plans are leaking. Every time he goes to trap the armies of Israel, the army's gone, and there's obviously someone who's an informant within, or there's a traitor, so he's going to expose the problem. But in this moment, one of his officers knows the real problem and shares it with the king. Verse 12, it's not us, my lord, the king. One of the officers replied, Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel, even the word 
speak in the privacy of your bedroom. Now, I imagine that was a little unnerving to the king. I imagine he must have asked, did anyone not think to tell me of this sooner? There's someone who knows what I'm saying, no matter where I'm saying it. And so the king takes action. Verse 13, go and find out where he is, the king commanded. Now listen, he should have written it down instead of said that out loud. He doesn't learn his lesson, does he? (laughs) Go and find out where he is so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. Now pause for a moment. Notice that this king means business. He doesn't send in an assassination squad. He doesn't send in a small troop of hitmen. Who does the king send in? He sends in a great army with many chariots and horses, enough to surround the city. His goal is not just to do this little assassination, take Elisha out. He's going to make a big show of it because he knows that this guy must have incredible power. So he literally sends an army big enough to surround this city where Elisha's at. Now, Elisha's got a young servant. This young servant gets up very early the next morning, looks out and sees that they're surrounded and is absolutely tripping by the time we see him in verse 15. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. (laughs) Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Now, I just want you to know, this young man, a servant of Elisha, would have been an assistant to him, gone where he's gone, seen what he's seen, and so he would have witnessed many things that Elisha's done in his past. Elisha's done some pretty powerful, miraculous things. But in this moment, he kind of realizes this is a checkmate scenario. There's not a way out. The city is surrounded. There's two of us. I I don't really know what you're going to pull out of your hat now. It seems impossible, it seems hopeless, it seems like there's no way out. You ever been there? You ever been at a place where you're like, there's no way out of this one? In fact, some of our moments where we had encounters, we were in such a position where it felt like there's no way out. And that's exactly this position. Verse 16, Elisha replies what any good, uh, (laughs) calm person would say, don't be afraid. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to comfort someone who's fearful or anxious, and if you just tell them, don't be afraid, does it usually help? No, because the reason for their fear is still staring at them in their face. It's like, what, what good is it to not be afraid? We're about to be destroyed. There's no way out. So what good does it do to say, don't be afraid? Why shouldn't I be afraid? And, and Elisha, I'm sure he saw the fear on his servant's face, and he makes this statement. He says, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Just Before we let that sink in fully, let's just read that together. There are more on our side than those against us. Now, now I imagine to the servant that sounded like Elisha hadn't had his coffee yet. That sounds like lunacy. Elisha, what do you know that I don't? What do you see that I don't? There's obviously something going on here that I can't understand. For you to make a statement like that, when you can see exactly what I can see, we're surrounded, there's an army surrounding this entire city. They're here for us. There's two of us. There's an army of them. And Elisha's response is this. So Elisha decides, I'm going to help out my servant. Verse 17, so Elisha then prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. (laughs) Imagine the servant's like, what am I missing? My eyes are open, sir. Like, I'm looking and I'm scared because I'm looking. What am I missing? 
And the Lord grants his prayer. He opens the young man's eyes. And when he, this young servant, looks up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. This would have been one of those moments where he wondered if he had had his coffee yet. And he looks around him suddenly and he can see these beings, this army that until now had been fully invisible. And all of a sudden he's given this window into this unseen world and I I can only imagine how staggered he must have been. Now, uh, just a few questions about this. How on earth was Elisha so aware of these armies of fire around him? Could he see them? Or did he just have a direct line with God where he knew they were there? Was it because this was just a normal part of his life that he could see things that those around him couldn't see? He could certainly hear things that those around him couldn't hear. But let me, let me make it a little more personal for just a moment. What if you could have a moment like this? What if for just 10 seconds, God could open your eyes and you could look around you right now in this room, in the room you're in, you could open your eyes and you of fire around you. You imagine seeing them, and imagine seeing them not just in isolation, but seeing them locked in battle with these other unseen beings. And imagine like that it's not just in the hillsides, but imagine that's happening right here among us. Imagine if you could see it. Imagine if you could see the fight that's going on right now for your attention, for your soul, for your marriage, for your family, for your community for your church. If for 10 seconds you and I could have some sort of eyes open and we could see this battle happening right now above us, among us, around us, would anyone begin to see life differently? I don't know that I would ever live the same again. I don't know if I would ever pray the same again. I don't know if I would ever think the same again. I don't know if I'd ever respond to temptation the same again. I think it would deeply impact my world. Now, some of you might be thinking, Justin, I think this was just a single supernatural event. But let me ask you, what if this wasn't just a one-off? What if this wasn't an anomaly? What if the anomaly is that a human was able to see it? What if that's the miracle? The miracle isn't that they were there. The miracle is that suddenly someone could see it. And I think you'd be closer to the truth because here's the passage we've been looking at, Ephesians 6.12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, physical, visible beings, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. We are engaged in a battle with enemies that we cannot see who are right here among us. And there is this cosmic battle that is happening not just in the cosmos, not just in the universe, not just in the heavenly places, but literally right here in this dark world, right here among us. And and the indication here is that it's more than just like a bunch of spirits, But they're organized and arranged like a military, rulers, authorities, mighty powers, evil spirits. And the idea is that there's a ranking, there's a structure, there's a system. Imagine if, imagine if there is a ranking demon who is overseeing green. And there's one for Bainbridge, and there's one at Cincy, and maybe there's a higher ranking one who's in charge of cities like Binghamton. 
that are a little bigger. Maybe there's a really high general who's in charge of New York City or a few of them. Right, and, and, and I know this is odd, I know it's strange, I know we can't see this, but if what this says is real, it's a tad bit scary. But what if what Elisha said that day to his servant is true today? What if these unseen beings are real, but there's literally more on our side than those against us? A couple weeks ago, we saw that greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. So God trumps Satan. We know that. But what if in this battle that's happening, raging around us, there are these unseen evil forces and beings that are real and they're ranked and they're powerful and they have areas and regions more than likely that they're controlling and they're sending messages back and forth to their chief puppet master. But what if there are unseen good beings who outnumber them and we just can't see them? What if they're all around us? If that's true, I think there's some pretty big implications. Before we talk about those implications, you want to see how the story turns out? I do too. So so let's just look at the rest of the story. Verse 18. As the Aramean army advanced towards him, Elisha prayed, O Lord, please make them blind. I love that. A little different than his last prayer. Lord, help him see. I was like, O Lord, make them blind. Would anyone else love to have the power of prayer like Elisha does? So the Lord struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Then Elisha went out and told them. (laughs) So he goes right out to them. There's this army that surrounded them, and now they're completely blind. He said, you've come the wrong way. This isn't the city. Follow me, and I will take you to the man you're looking for. This is awesome. Imagine a servant servant was trying not to laugh out loud. Like, here's the guy that they're here to assassinate, and he's like, oh, I think you guys are lost. Let me guide you to where you're trying to go. And he led them to the city of Samaria, this bigger city with the troops of Israel there. As soon as they had entered Samaria, Elisha prayed, oh, Lord, now open their eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they discovered that they were in the middle of Samaria. I bet there was a general in the crowd there that thought, I'm going to lose my job. And all the soldiers were like, we're going to lose our heads. When the king of Israel saw them, he shouted to Elisha, my father. Elisha was very respected, especially in this moment. Should I kill them? Should I kill them? I mean, the king's pretty excited. Like, here's his enemy right there. And Elisha replies, of course not. Do we kill prisoners of war? Give them. And I imagine the troops are like, how did we become prisoners anyway? What happened? A little bit ago, we were surrounding the guy we were there to kill. I I don't get what happened. He says, give them food and drink and send them home again to their master. So they laid out a full-on golden corral feast for these guys. All right? The king made a great feast for them and then sent them home to their master. I love the ending of the story. After that, the Aramean writers stayed away from the land of Israel. There's so much here that's ironic. The, the irony of God answering Elisha's prayer that his servant can see the invisible. And right after that, God answers his prayer that an entire army can't see the visible. And then, as God supernaturally giving sight and taking sight, these guys realize they're trapped. They get fed this huge meal And they go home convinced of one thing. They are never again going to mess with Elisha. They are never going to mess with Elisha because Elisha has power and he has access to some power that they can't see, they can't understand. That's a cool story. What if, though, today, you and I still had access to that same power? You see, when it comes to invisible beings who are fighting on the behalf of God's people, they are mentioned not rarely in the Bible. They're mentioned often. Do you know in the Old Testament alone, they're mentioned over a hundred times. In the New Testament, they're mentioned 165 times. They're mentioned in over 34 books 
of the Bible. From the first, earliest ones of Genesis and Job all the way to the last one of Revelation. Jesus talked about angels. Angels were highly at work and visible during the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. They were all activated kind of on high alert during that divine mission. Angels are never considered to be illusions or figments of people's imaginations. And the Bible actually makes it clear that millions of these unseen beings, the Bible says thousands of thousands, thousands times thousands, that'd be millions, were created by God and serve God, delivering his messages and doing his work. Now, the word angel means messenger of God. Now, I would love to really get in depth with angel stuff because, again, there's over 265 references to angels. There are things that we can't, because of time, get into today. But some of you who have read this stuff, you may know that there's this angel of God who seems to be more powerful than all the other angels. And he appears multiple times in the Old Testament. But as soon as Jesus comes, he, he never appears again. Who is he? Research that. Fascinating. You also see in Scripture there's, this, there's multiple death angels, they're called, who are responsible for some massacres, including a future death angel who's going to be responsible for killing a third of humans on earth. It's talked about in the prophecies of Revelation. Who are those death angels? Are they on the good team or the bad team? Research that. I mean, it's just fascinating stuff. But although we can't get into everything, there are a few details about angels that I would love to share with you today because maybe they're, they're common misconceptions. And one of those uh, is a question that Jesus was asked directly. Um, he, was, he was asked about eternity and you know, what are humans going to be like in eternity because we become immaterial, right? We lose our material bodies, so do we become angels? And Jesus was very clear, we, we don't become angels. We become like angels in certain ways in that we don't have a body. But we become like angels, we don't marry or procreate. And so can angels marry or procreate? Jesus indicates that's not possible. Should I worship angels? And the answer to that is any time someone tried, and people tried in the records of Scripture when they appeared, no good angel will allow someone to worship them. They won't allow it. So I should never worship an angel. Should I pray to an angel? And the answer is a clear no. I should always and only pray to God. Pray to God. Angels are agents of God. They are messengers of God. They operate at God's command. So go directly to the main source. And let God dispatch who he wants. My prayer should only be to God through Jesus. Do humans become angels after death? And, and the answer is no. Humans always stay humans. Angels were created as angels. There's no more that are created now. Um, do angels have to earn their wings? My apologies to Clarence Oddbody. And the answer is no. If that poor guy doesn't have his wings, he ain't never getting wings. Do we know the, the names of angels? There are two named angels in the Bible. Fascinating. The one is named Gabriel. Gabriel is one of God's chief messengers. He's, he's been sent to deliver some pretty significant messages at the birth of Jesus and before to Zechariah, to Mary, to Joseph, even to Daniel in the Old Testament. Um, the name Gabriel means hero of God. Seems like he's one of God's right-hand angels. Uh, there's another named angel. You might have known this one. What's his name? The most powerful angel, Michael. Michael. And his name means who is like God. And he is called an archangel. An archangel. A chief angel. Uh, he's, he's this powerful, unseen prince of angels who protects Israel. That seems to be one of his main responsibilities. And he battles Satan. He kind of goes toe-to-toe -to -toe directly with Satan himself. Now, when we talk about this unseen war, are there any other unseen beings that we're aware of besides angels 
that are out there. I mean, what about, what about Cupid? What is, what is he? He's the Roman god of love. And, and you can't get much cuter than little Cupid, right? Well, as much as all of that stuff is mythology, it comes from this idea that there's, there's only one unseen being besides spirits after we die, and that would be angels, but there's not just one type of angel. There's actually three that are given to us, and unfortunately for Cupid, he's not one of them. There's three types of angels that we're taught about in the Word of God. The first are cherubim. Cherubim are considered to be the fiercest, mightiest, most powerful angels. Their responsibility is to guard the throne of God. And so they're just, they're just created differently. Um, the description of them, it, it, there's a couple prophets that have been able to see them and have described them, and the, the description is just staggering. Uh, they have four faces. They have four wings. Um, there's four of them. There's no indication there's more than four cherubim. Uh, anyone know of a famous named cherubim angel? Lucifer. Satan was one of them, is one of them. Uh, seraphim is the other type of angel. You, you might have heard about them in some songs, the seraphim. Um, seraphim simply means the fiery ones. They are described as having six wings, and that's to cover themselves when they're in the presence of God. And, and they have like a human-like appearance. They're attendants at the throne of God. They're responsible for cleansing the throne area and praising God. And they do this all the time, regularly in God's presence. There's this nonstop, really incredible concert that's going on in the presence of God. And it's the seraphim who are doing that. And then you've got just the regular angels. But the regular angels aren't like the angels on your Christmas tree or the tattoos or anything. These regular angels are the ones that you see most often in Scripture. They have faces that are described as like lightning. Their clothes are so bright, whiter than snow, they're dazzling. And when people encountered these angels in history, their response was instantaneously terror. Okay, not the typical response I have when I see Cupid or Clarence Oddbody, terror. These are mighty, fearsome beings. And it's more than likely what Elisha's servant saw that day around him, these angels, these, these beings of fire. And although these guys do fly, there's no proof that they have wing, wings. We don't know for sure, but they do fly. They can appear and disappear their primary purpose is to worship God and to carry out his orders on earth. Luke 16, 2 even indicates that they help to usher a, a believer who dies. They help to usher their soul to God in heaven. The description that we find in Scripture of these guys, again, all of these descriptions is far different than angels in the end zone or what you see in pop culture. And it's crazy to think that a third of these fell away from God in the rebellion. third of them. So that's, that's millions, we're not sure how many, but a third of these mighty powerful beings fell away from God, were kicked out of heaven. We learned this a couple weeks ago. So, so this crazy unseen war that's going on, there are some powerful beings that God intended to be used for his good that are now being used as agents of evil, agents of darkness. And they have a singular leader who makes a really good job of cloaking himself as an angel of light coming across as someone who's good. The Bible describes the cherub Satan, this powerful unseen being Satan, as, as like a prowling lion. In that, he is prowling around the earth, going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He's on a seek and destroy mission, much like the Aramean army. Now the good news, and we learned this last two weeks, is that Satan is a created being, thus he's limited. He can't be in two places at once. He can't read minds. He can't be all-knowing. He can't be all-powerful because he's a created, finite being. But don't forget what we learned last week. What Satan lacks in power, he makes up with his team. 
He doesn't work alone. And so there's this team of dark beings that are working overtime to sow chaos and division across our world. Now, a few more things about angels here that we see in Scripture that I don't want us to miss. In Matthew 18, it says this, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Talking about kids and new believers, Jesus is using kids as an example. For I tell you that, what does it say here? Their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. When it says their angels, what comes to mind? Yes, yes, don't drive faster than your guardian angel can fly. Guardian angels. This is the only scriptural hint that we have that there are such things as guardian angels. I hate to burst your bubble though, but that, that there there is not a personal pronoun, it's a collective pronoun. And so it's not saying that every person has an angel. What it is saying is that children and believers have angels who go to bat for them in the unseen world. And these angels, these unseen beings who go to bat for them in the unseen world, all face of my Father in heaven. In other words, they have access to the throne of God. And so they're always watching God to say, do, do, you, want, do you want me to go? Do I have permission? Can, can I go ahead and do this? And so there's this powerful concept that these angels that are out there that are tasked with helping to protect us, helping to guide us, helping to give messages, that they are always gaining access to the very face of God himself. Just like the dark angels report directly to Satan, the good angels report directly to God himself. They don't get mixed messages. Now you may wonder, okay, is that saying... I don't understand if we have angels there to protect us. Well, then how come you still have abuse? How come you still have all these stuff, these things that happen to children or to people that, that shouldn't be happening? Well, again, that's part of this cosmic war. This is Satan's turf. This is his territory. God is just as grieved by the mess as you and I are, even more so. This is not what God intended. But God does, in the same statement, Jesus makes this, he says this. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, a kid, a child of God, if they cause them to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. In other words, cross one of my kids and drowning would be a more merciful option than what we're going to do to you. Right? So, so one day God will balance the scales. One day God will execute his judgment on those who harm or hurt little kids or those who follow him. Psalm 91, for he will order his angels to protect Interestingly enough, does anyone know what famous person quoted this psalm in the New Testament? It was a cherub angel named Satan. He quoted this to Jesus when he told him to jump off the temple. And Jesus obviously wouldn't do it because he knew that he was misquoting this promise. This is from Psalm 91, which is the psalm of confidence in God's protection of us. This one's fascinating, 1 Peter 1.12. It is also wonderful, talking about salvation, human salvation, Jesus coming to earth, dying on the cross. It's also wonderful watching these things happen. So the indication are that when Jesus came, when he died, the angels are like sitting on the edge of their seats, like, what is he doing? And why is he doing it for them? You know, Jesus didn't die for the angels. He doesn't offer salvation to angels. They got one chance, those who blew it, they're doomed. But humans get one chance and we, we blow it. And God sends his own son down to die for us. And the angels are just fascinated by this. So just know, as fascinated as we are by angels, they're just as fascinated by us. They're fascinated by us. And especially they're fascinated by our relationship with God. And some scholars even think that this verse indicates that angels are a little bit jealous of the connection that we can have with God. And the extraordinary love God has by sending his own son to die for us as humans. 
There's something else that's fascinating because we look at angels kind of in this other world. We deeply respect them. We know they're more powerful than us. But God indicates this in 1 Corinthians 6.3. Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. 1 Corinthians 6 is the passage about don't sue another believer. Don't go to court. You should be able to take care of this outside of court because you're my kids. And if someday you're going to be sitting in judgment of angels, you should be able to judge amongst yourselves. Pretty powerful stuff. This is crazy. Hebrews 13.2. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Time for goosebumps. What if angels can take human form? Now, angels are not humans, but what if they can take human form? And what if they can appear and disappear at will? That happened in Scripture multiple times. Genesis 18 is one such story. Abraham hosted and fed some angels. Uh, It happened again in the book of Acts. We see angels being able to take human form, appear and disappear at will. Some of you go back to some of your encounters and it makes you shiver even more. Some of you are never going to treat strangers the same again. It changes and it should change how we handle and treat strangers. Because there is this unseen world that occasionally becomes seen. And we don't know when that is or how often it is or where it is. But it should absolutely change how we live. Look at Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Another way to see this is some trust in what they can see. Right? Some are confident in American might because they can see our military, and that's always a trap. It's always a trap to put your trust in what you can see. Because how much more powerful to put your trust in the name of the Lord our God? How much more trust Christians, followers of Jesus, should have because our trust is not in the visible world. Our trust is in the invisible world. And what if we trusted that what Elisha said to his servant, there are more on our side than those against us? What if we trusted that was true today? Because see, yeah, a third of the angels fell, but you know what that means? Two-thirds of them remain loyal to God. And they're all around us battling for us and with us and on our behalf. You know, I think what we struggle to see is we struggle to see and understand what's in the invisible world. We see the visible world right now. You look at Mariupol and how that city has been leveled by Russian artillery and bombs. And your heart is more than likely grieved. You've seen the millions of refugees that have flooded out of Ukraine. You see the devastation of the thousands of lives. They found all these bodies yesterday in one of the cities that they came back to retake after the Russians left. But as much as there's devastation going on in Ukraine, do you see the devastation going on in America? Right? Not to, not to make less of that, but the war is just as real here. When you see our prisons full, when you see our marriages broken, when you see our schools and communities divided, the war is just as real right here. And Satan and his dark angels are heavily at work sowing division and seeking who they can devour and take out and silence and destroy. But my friends, there are more on our side than those against us. How different would we live if we got a 10-second look at what we can't see? How different would we live if our eyes were open? We saw these beams of fire coming against us, but we saw them locked up and engaged with good beams of fire who are pushing against them, protecting and guarding us and agents of God on our behalf. I think I'd have time on my knees if I could get those 10 seconds. Because this is a battle I can't win in human effort. 
I can't see them. I can't touch them. And yet they're just as real as if I could. And if I could start living my life in the confidence that not only is the unseen world real, but God's power is stronger than the power of the evil one. I am living and you are living in a dark world. We are ostracized. We are outcasts in this world. We are strangers and pilgrims in a foreign land. But there are more on our side than those against us. We are not alone. You are never alone. And someday, when you get to the other side and you get to watch back your life, you may be stunned to realize in those moments the interventions that happened out of your sight because there is a God who loves you and there is a God who has your back. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning? Father, I thank you that you don't leave us in ignorance about this unseen war. I thank you that you have shown us this story of Elisha and his servant the day where his eyes were opened. God, I would love I would love to see. I would love to see what's going on around us in this room today. It is so much more real than I give credit to and credence to. And you are so much more powerful than I can imagine. Lord, I pray for followers of Jesus here. God, it's easy to feel alone. It's easy to feel marginalized. It's easy to feel ostracized. It's easy to feel outnumbered. Help every child of God listening to me today to know that not only are they not alone, but there are more on their side than those against them. May they see with their heart what they can't see with their eyes. May you give us the faith to believe that this unseen world is real. And may we put our trust in the name of our God, not in what we can see. Lord, I pray for the person who hears me today that has not yet joined your team. You are clear that right now they are a captive of the evil one and you say to, to teach gently in, in the hopes that they'll come to their senses. And so, Lord, maybe today you're stirring something in their heart. Maybe today they're coming to their senses. Maybe they're a good person. Maybe they, they I mean, they're, they're listening or they're in church, and, and yet that's not enough. What must happen is they must believe by faith in the Son of God and be forgiven of their sin and be adopted into your family. God, today may angels be on the edges of their seats as they, as they watch your salvation at work in the hearts of someone who surrenders to you. And God, you say that there is more rejoicing in heaven when someone comes to salvation. And so today, may there be a heavenly party because someone became your child, was rescued from the kingdom of darkness, and was purchased and brought into the kingdom of light. God, help us to realize that this isn't our battle. This is your battle. We fight this thing. And we win this thing on our knees. May we be diligent in our prayers to our mighty God. And we pray this in his name. Amen.